welcome to our Sunday morning worship service at Central Baptist Church. We are so happy that you were able to be with us. My name is Savannah, and before we get started, here are some opportunities happening in the life of our fellowship. If you are new to Central, thanks for joining us as our guest. To help us get to know you better, we have orange cards located behind the seat in front of you. Please take the time to fill it out and leave it on your seat before you go. The card can also be filled out on our church website, cbcdone.com. If you would like to give, there will be ushers accepting offerings at the back after the service. Giving can also be made online or in the collection box located in the back. We are grateful for the faithful givers at Central that help support the gospel work. Mark your calendars that our annual community outreach event, the Patriotic Explosion, will be Sunday, June 26th at 7. Invite your friends, family, and neighbors to this time of free food and fireworks. This year, we will be celebrating local heroes of our community, as well as honoring all of the brave men and women who have served our country in the armed forces. It's amazing what God is doing through our congregation and through the body of Christ. Here's an opportunity for you. As the CYA coordinator for Child Evangelism Fellowship for our area, I see children all the time that have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. But this year, God has given us 50 missionaries, student missionaries that are re ready and willing to share the gospel. Right now, we have a serious need. We need club hosts, locations where we can tell children about the gospel. And we also need drivers to help transport these missionaries to the locations where the kids are. Contact me, Rita Hall, today. Or you can call the church office this week we are committed to helping volunteers find the place where God has called them to serve with us so that children can hear the gospel. Thank you so much. Hey parents, we have our preschool Bible camp happening Monday, June 27th through Thursday, June 30th. This is for all kids three years old through rising first graders. The theme this year is Kingdom Chronicles. We will be learning about how to stand strong in the battle for truth as we find out more about the armor of God and other awesome Bible adventures. You can sign your kid up today at cbcdone.com or on the Church Center app. We would like to invite you all back on campus this evening. Kids in kindergarten through fifth grade will be gathering in the tabernacle at five for the Kids Central Live service. Students in 6th through 12th grade will have their weekly worship service, Sunday Night Live, at 5.30 in the Student Center. All adults will be gathering in the chapel at 6 for the House of Prayer. All the services and activities will be finished by 7. Thank you again for joining us. If you have any questions, please stop by Grand Central Station in the back of the Tabernacle or talk with any of our pastors available after the service. Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you today. For some of you, especially those in school, this is the first Sunday of summer break. And I know you all are excited for that, but we're so glad that you would take uh, this Sunday, the Lord's Day, to worship God with us. This was mentioned earlier, but there's an orange card underneath the seat in front of you. If you could take that, if you're new here to Central, fill that out and just leave it on your seat before you go. And let's also be uh, standing at this time, be in prayer for our Family Palooza missions trip team. They're uh, out of state in Ohio serving a church, and they're representing us. Um, but let's take this time to worship God together. Would you go to the Lord and pray? God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to sit under the teaching and preaching and the singing of your word. So God, we just ask that your spirit would fill this place, um, that we would experience you, that we would be um, refreshed by your word. And God, we ask for your filling in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Choir, you can come up at this time. Let's worship the Lord together. By the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. He that's so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of His presence with me. 
doth continually wear. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. I think for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. I know I shall see in His beauty the King in His way I delight. His love and regard is my footsteps. And giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Shout it forever I am. Amen. Amen. It's good to be redeemed this morning. Good to see you all this morning, too. I uh, was reading, thanks to Sherry Pitcher, in on her social media about Paul and Silas, how um, in Acts chapter 16, they had been preaching the gospel and were put in prison and chained up for preaching the gospel, for sharing Jesus to people. And uh, it says they started praying in the middle of the night, started praying. And they started singing and started praising God. And their chains fell off and they were loose. They were free because of that. So I just wanted to remind you, for whatever is ailing you, whatever is bothering you today, instead of grumbling and complaining about it, praise God through it. <laughs> and uh, also, we get to praise Him this morning. How wonderful is that? Don't just go through the motions this morning, praising this morning, because we get to. It's awesome. You can be seated. Worship with us.
Let's all stand together. He is wonderful this morning. May, the, may He be center, the very center of our lives, every part of it. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been. Sing that chorus again, Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been. Nothing else matters. Nothing in this world you do. Jesus, you're the Savior. Everything revolves around you.
center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. Father, this morning we want our worship to be about you, and we are grateful that not just our worship, but our entire lives are centered around you and word that you are the center. There's nothing in this world that can satisfy, nothing in this world that can please and bring the deep satisfaction that you can. And Lord, we are grateful for that this morning. We are drawn to you by our worship. And Lord, in this moment of worship, in the songs and in the scriptures that we will receive, I ask, Father, that you will draw us to Jesus alone. Point our eyes and our minds and our hearts toward him. And as we look full in his wonderful face, may the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We worship and exalt you today, Father. May you be blessed by how we receive your word this morning. We pray and ask this all in Jesus' name. And when all the church together said, amen. You can be seated. It is so good to see you here this morning. Good to have some, some guests with us. What a privilege before the service to get to meet some new friends and folks who have come. Uh, they're visiting from out of town, and I know it's a busy time of the year, but it's good to be in the house of God this morning. Aren't you glad to be here? Has the music blessed you this morning? Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord for Christ-centered, God-honoring songs that point us to Jesus. Uh, it is. Let me take a moment and encourage you, as Pastor Chuck mentioned, be praying for our Palooza team. They are serving this week in the Kentucky and Ohio area, uh, doing, doing what they do so well with uh, some churches there, sharing the gospel, pray for souls to be saved, pray for opportunities, and pray that there'll be a blessing to the churches there as they are serving. And let me also encourage you, uh, you saw the announcement about the CEF missionaries, 50 uh, young people who are going out to share the gospel this summer. And um, if you know of a place where they could uh, have a gospel club and share the gospel, then please let Rita know, Rita Hall, or reach out to our church office if you have an idea or an opportunity for that. Uh, we want them to have plenty of opportunities to share Jesus. What our world needs is Jesus Christ. And um, the longer I live, the more convinced I am of that. Uh, to see what's going on. This is what the world needs. There's a lot of solutions, a lot of answers, but Jesus is the answer. Uh, it is our privilege today to have a guest speaker with us, and um, Mark Walker has served uh, 16 years as a pastor and um, various roles in pastoring in our state and other states. And um, I've, we've got a number of mutual acquaintances and friends, and I didn't have the privilege to meet him until uh, recently when Pastor Tom introduced me to him, and it's a privilege to know him. For six years, he served in the House of Representatives, and um, he's a man of God, and most importantly, he's God's man to bring us the word this morning. So get your Bibles ready, and join me, if you will, in welcoming Mark Walker to our service this morning. Thank you, Pastor Cloud. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Cloud. It is a privilege to be with you folks this morning. I, I really appreciated the music, and thank you for having a choir, Pastor Hughes. Uh, thank you for leading that this morning. And the thing I think that impressed me the most was there was no music. You guys were just up there getting it done, and that communicates so much more. And I, I appreciate the work and the discipline, the dedication that goes into that. So my heart's already rejoicing with you. Pastor Cloud, is it, it is an honor to be here. I'm going to give you a little bit of my background, and then we'll get into, uh, into the Word this morning. I, uh, I grew up in the panhandle of Florida. Uh, some people would call that the Redneck Riviera. Uh, I've also heard it to L.A., Lower Alabama. Uh, but it was the Deep South. In North Florida, they don't, the rest of Florida didn't really consider us part of uh, Florida. Uh, several different cultures and communities in that area. But grew up there. I, uh, my father was a pastor. I uh, grew up with two younger brothers, we either, most of the time either at church or on a ball field or something. Uh, moved us to Houston, Texas in 89. I was halfway through school and college there. And I, uh, if you've ever been to Houston, Texas in August, oh my goodness gracious, uh, you realize uh, how hot it is. I was uh, in D.C. one day and I was telling my staff uh, just how hot it gets in Houston, Texas. And I was 
relaying the fact that I had a cassette tape that actually melted on my dashboard when one of the 25-year-olds raised his hand and said, you know where I'm going with this. Hey, boss, what's a cassette tape? He's no longer with us, but that's for different reasons, right? So, uh, but uh, moved to North Carolina March of 1991, March 25th, rode into town with $600 in my pocket to my name, uh, uh, with a preacher's kid, as you might imagine, uh, but started working in business and finance. Uh, there was a gentleman that came into our business one day, and I recognized him as either, and this is the only two profiles I get mixed up, I probably shouldn't say this, as an independent Baptist pastor and insurance salesman. So I knew he was one of the two, I just didn't know which, ends up being a pastor, so he invites me to his church that Sunday. I had been visiting at a church over in Walkertown, North Carolina, but nevertheless, I finally consented after much badgering. So that Sunday morning, I I get rolling, looking for his church, while I get lost. Fairly new to town in Winston-Salem. I couldn't remember if he said Highway 109 or Highway 150. Well, I, I keep passing this one church called Grace Baptist Temple, and even though my mom was 1,200 miles away, I knew that she would know quicker than the Almighty whether I was in church that Sunday morning. Maybe you had a mom like that as well. Uh, Nevertheless, I pull in about the time the music starts, and I see this blonde sitting on the second row down front. Now, I have no recollection of what her daddy was preaching on, even though later I had to act like I did. Uh, But long story short, uh, we've been married 30 years um, this coming uh, December. She's a family nurse practitioner there at Wake Forest Medical Center. Most of her career... She has flown on the helicopter, what they call air care over there. So she's wonderful. We have three children, and we're content to just be involved, work in ministry and business. And about five or six years into that, uh, God began to work in our hearts about doing something that I promised that I would never do. And that would be to follow my dad's footsteps as a Baptist pastor. I wanted no part of it. I was happy with you handling your junk. I would handle mine. We'd be good, right? Uh, and that's the supernatural calling on, your, on Pastor Cloud and your pastors here because the amazing thing is not only do they carry lives and their families and all the different things that they're walking through, but they're walking through your journey as well. And that's, that's the calling part. That's what's not natural for them to make space, for God to make space, to be able to lead and walk uh, through here at Central Baptist. But went back to school, pastor for 16 years, and about eight years ago, God began to work on our heart about the direction of our country, uh, really began to pray and, and struggle about what that meant, stepped away from ministry at the end of 2013, ran for Congress in 2014, that's not what we're here today about, but God opened up some amazing doors, uh, sworn in in January 15, uh, hit the ground running. Um, it, people ask me, uh, Congressman, how did you hit the ground running so quickly? Now, what you know and what they didn't know and what I had realized, if you can survive a Baptist business meeting, you can about work with Nancy. Well, never mind. I won't go that far. I don't know anybody can do that. So anyway, uh, you know, we, we, we laugh a little bit, but uh, man, our, our country's in, in a tough place. Um, we, this, is, this is, I've realized in six years in the U.S. Congress, how much more this is about spiritual warfare than it is politics. Uh, and I know there's reporters and media sometimes that know where I'm speaking or whatever, and they, they can't stand that line, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, we are at a place where we've turned our back on our fundamental Judeo-Christian principles that are still literally etched in the marble and in stone throughout Washington, D.C. So uh, as I'm thinking about this this morning, what's our job as believers? What's our role as Christians this morning? Has it changed? And I and I, as I was reading the other day, uh, out of Matthew chapter 16, where we'll take our text from today, Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 24 and 25, I really want to dial it down or, or unpack uh, three action steps of a, of a believer. If you want to put a title to it, I'm going to call it three action steps of a believer for you and for me. And I want to take the passage there, Matthew chapter 16, toward the latter part of the chapter, And we'll begin reading in verse 24 and 25. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25, For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Father God, we pause just for a moment this morning. Our hearts have been moved and blessed by the worship and the music this morning as we give you praise 
Lord, as we look into the Word, as I look into the Word, remind all of us this morning exactly the calling that you have placed on every single believer here this morning. Guide us as we study and look at this Word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, we'll start with verse 24. There's three things that Jesus lays out. For much of my ministry life, and even in the political arena, I used to read this passage and think, okay, there are three things here that Jesus is saying that are all packed together. The more I looked into this, the more I studied it, the more I realized these are three different steps, if you will, three different decisions, maybe even say three different choices that we've been presented with. And here's the interesting thing. Jesus is very emphatic on here. If you're going to be a disciple, there's three things. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. So what I'd like to do is unpack beginning with the first one, okay? So let's look at the first thing. It says, number one, you desire to come after me. If you desire to be a disciple, the very first thing Jesus says is learning to deny yourself. Now, I got to tell you, uh, I'm a pretty transparent person, kind of a straight shooter. That wasn't my first instinct this morning, to deny myself. First thing, think, that's like I got time to go buy a McDonald's and get an Egg McMuffin and an iced tea, right? I'm not a big coffee drinker, but nevertheless, we immediately think of our own desires, our own needs. Our instinct isn't to deny ourselves. It isn't to a place of discipline. And the reason that Jesus is saying, finding that time or, or denying yourself, is to be able to tone out all the noise that's around us all the time. Uh, we're bombarded in our culture with constant filling up. There's no wasted space. Uh, there's no dead space. We're constantly moving from the one thing to the next thing. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that really has consumed our life is our little mobile phones, you know, social media, who said something about me on Twitter this morning. So far, so good. All the different things that we're, we're consumed with that is creating so much noise in our life that there's never any time where we're denying ourselves and hearing from the Lord. Jesus was a great model of this when he's at the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, praying, not my will but yours be done, Lord. How much time this past week, and I ask myself the same thing, have I spent, could I go back and say, okay, there was a time, there was a few minutes there that I, that I denied myself, here's a few minutes over here. What does that look like? Well, denying yourself means sometimes just riding them the road, turning off the radio, just fellowshipping with the Lord. Uh, denying ourself is, is certainly through prayer, through being in the Word. Uh, th sometimes we don't talk about it as much, but even through fasting. Uh, de denying that self, that flesh, to be able to create a time where the Holy Spirit can speak to us, where we can have fellowship with the Lord. Otherwise, it's always about bent on our own desires. And look, I'm not saying necessarily bad things uh, that we're consumed with. Uh, and a lot of times it's, it's good things, but we get so covered up and so busy and running so fast that there's never any times that we're creating space or denying ourselves for us to be able to hear from the Spirit, be able to hear from the Lord. Number one, to deny yourself. But number two, just when you think, you say, okay, Mark, I've got some times that I deny myself. Well, <clears throat> number two is, if for me, is even tougher. It says, take up your cross. Woo! I don't, let me just be straight. I don't like that. At first glance, when it says, deny yourself, and then two, take up your cross. If, if I was to go down every single row, sitting on this side, this side, up, up this is second balcony down the floor, Here's the thing, probably everybody could talk about a cross they're carrying, because here's the thing, if, as a believer, we're asked to carry the cross. So, so what does that look like in your life? Is it marital, relational, financial? Is it a wayward son or daughter? Is it a work situation or a lack of work situation? Uh, is it short term? Is it long term? Here's the interesting thing. <clears throat> the taking up the cross part is actually the journey portion of our walk with the Lord. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is, Proverbs talks about this is the time that the dross is burnt off that we can come forth as gold. It's also the time when the world is watching the most. The, the world doesn't pay attention when you're on the mountaintop. You know, you got an extra paycheck, got some overtime, everything is just right. Everybody celebrates and gets excited. The world watches you when you're in the middle of that time where you're carrying that cross. That's when they want to see the difference in your life. Carrying the cross, what does it look like in your life? Sometimes it means complete brokenness. I mean, just where you're just brought out, prostrate in front of the Lord, asking how could something so unfair, unjust, or dare I say even ungodly, 
happen in our lives. It's very easy to quote Romans 8, 28. Uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to call to call to give his purpose, right? It's another thing to live it out when things, when we encounter our life. Look, the cross wasn't fair to Jesus. The, the, the cross not only is a painful representation, but it's also one of humiliation. Sometimes Jesus is asking us to decrease where he can increase. That's not natural for us. Of all the different things that you've gone through, now, now, I'm, I'm going somewhere, it's not all gloom and doom, because I'm going to cross-reference here in just a few minutes, but, but, but I think sometimes in, in growing up in the church and pastoring, what I have witnessed at times, I believe the toughest cross to carry, sometimes, many times, is the cross of betrayal. For whatever reason, sometimes that's the one that sticks, that's the one that enemy can kind of get engaged, and before you know it, we're, we're carrying something because something's been done to us, something's been said about us. I've even seen it in the church where uh, doing memorial or funeral service where one side of the family is sitting on this side, the other side of the family is sitting on this side because something that was said 30, 40 years ago. Look, look let's, I get it. Betrayal is tough. Having to forgive somebody that on paper isn't worth forgiving or letting go of a situation the Apostle Paul uh, talks about this uh, in, in Philippians 3, where he's talking about forgetting those things which are behind us. Now, you notice that he doesn't say whether they're good things or bad things. Either one can be weight. But a lot of times what I have seen, what I have witnessed, is that something has happened and the enemy has used it. Now, look, I get it. Uh, when we walk out those doors this, this afternoon, or this in just a few minutes, this afternoon, in about 20 minutes, all right? Before, I didn't want you to leave out those doors too quick. Um, it, it, when we walk out there, we're kind of prepared to take on the world, right? We know Ephesians 6, the helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, breastplate of righteousness. Man, we're quenching those fiery darts, got that one there. We're, we're ready to take on the world because we know what's coming at us. But more often than not, what takes our feet out from under us is when we get hit from inside the camp. That's what takes your breath. And so many times that cross is presented in a way that it's just, man, it's just tough to swallow. Kelly Clarkson sang a song about a dozen years ago. I was doing a commencement address the other night. I was thinking about this and realized it came out when they were in kindergarten. They were graduating, so my goodness gracious. But she, th there was a lyric in there that said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, that's not necessarily the truth. What doesn't kill you, yes, it can make you better, but it can also make you bitter. It can make you angry. It can harbor things. And, and listen, under the sound of my voice this morning, some of you have gone through legitimate, tragic, painful, genuine, hurtful situations. And I get it. But sometimes what the Lord allowed, though we don't even understand it in our finite minds, the enemy can use to literally miss the direction of what God is calling us to do. I, I played a little uh, football in high school and a small school, uh, but I ended up playing some quarterback. The, foot, the coach had a drill called bull in the ring. I don't even know if it's politically correct to do this drill anymore. Who knows, right? So, but they would put a circle, and they would put uh, one player in the circle with the football. And you would hold the football, like when you hand off the football there, and, um, and the coach would call a number. Now, I don't know what moral benefit the quarterback had to be in there with some of the linemen but evidently the coach thought I needed some of that so the so he would call the number you know number 88 that's a wide receiver get your center of gravity you know and you kind of hit pads and you know number 42 after about two or three of these the coach would call out a number number 65 and for a minute I was thinking 65 was here but 65 was over here and before I could actually get turned whoo I mean, bam, right in that ear hole. It would ring your bell. Uh, how many fingers? One, two, or three. Back then, if you got a half of them right, you were back in, right? So uh, the, the, the idea was this, is that when I had a moment to get turned to get that center of gravity, like you're throwing a punch, you're hitting a ball or something, you're prepared for it. You're braced for it. But when it's that blindside shot right in that ear hole of life, man, that's what takes our breath especially when it's somebody that looks like us, that walks like us, that claims Christ like us, 
How do we process that? Is that the cross that you're carrying this morning? Denying yourself, take up your cross. I, I, even, even David put it this way in Psalms 55, in verse 12, David says this. This is King David. It says, for it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in the company. Now, the point is this, and I'm moving on from this, is do not let the enemy use somebody else to literally miss what God's best is for your life. It doesn't take much because that we can get consumed by. And the point I'm trying to drive home, it doesn't mean that you're not right in, in the case you're making. But at some point, to release that back to the, to the Lord, the, to allow him to use it for his good, to, to, to allow us to grow through that, that we can become the minister and the believer that he's called us to do. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and then three, follow Jesus. I want us to think about that. Because we think about denying herself, we think about carrying the cross, it, there's a touch of that that seems heavy, but, but it's not. Ma Matthew eleven thirty, 30, Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, wait a second. How do we square that? It's kind of a paradox, a seemingly contradiction at first until we think about this. When we try to carry that cross and we begin to look at that direction to follow, when we try to carry all of that in our own strength, I can tell you, me, I'll end up in the ditch with it, right? But when I'm able to surrender it back to the Lord, oftentimes it's then when he opens up that path or the direction that I'm to go. Denying yourself, taking up the cross, and then following Jesus. This is kind of where I love Ephesians 3.20, where I think it fits perfectly in here, when it says, Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus, that Jesus is wanting to do exceedingly, abundantly more than what we can ever think Hope, imagine, and I'm guilty of this. How many times do we put margins or parameters of God in our own life, right? He's asking us to go a certain direction. Remember Moses tried this at the burning bush. Jesus, God, I'm not the orator in the family. That's Aaron. Uh, you check with him on that. We do that all the time. Uh, and here's the thing. We look at ourselves the way the world looks at us and sees the limitations. You know, you didn't go to the right school. You don't make enough money. I, I remember... Um, uh, January 2019, I was, uh, had the opportunity to be named ranking member on intelligence and counterterrorism for a Homeland Security subcommittee, right? So I'm looking at the dossiers and all the resumes before we go into some of our classified hearings and looking at all the education and a couple of big Ivy degrees. My closest friend, John Ratcliffe, uh, he did his undergraduate at Notre Dame Law School at SMU, and then they get to W for Walker, I flip the page there, uh, Mark Walker, Piedmont Bible College. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture, right? And it was just kind of an example to show that sometimes God confounds the wise uh, with the simple, with, 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 with things that don't make sense. Because when people look at it or see us following Jesus in a certain way to, to do whatever he's called us to do, the world doesn't process that. Like, why would that person be called? Why would, why would that he or she have the opportunity? Well, it's designed to reflect God's glory and God's working in our lives. So deny ourselves, take up a cross, and follow Jesus. What does the follow Jesus look like in your life? If I was to ask you, and I have to ask myself this morning, we're saying, okay, we, we're here you on deny yourself. We understand the cross part. But then Jesus says, follow me. What does that look like for your life? I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about vocation. Uh, Jesus says, give us our daily bread. His mercies are new each morning. How are we following God today and tomorrow? That, that's the challenge in, in our lives. Uh, because here's the, here's the thing, and I told a group of graduates this Friday night. Psalms 139 says this, that each and every one of you, these boys and girls sitting down front, each and every one of you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, our culture doesn't teach that, but God says that. And that means this, that he knew you when you were in your mother's womb, which means he's got a perfect and specific plan for your life every single day. Purpose. 
We talk about careers and jobs and vocations. Do we talk about purpose a whole lot? What's the purpose? And, and here's the thing. It's, as I said, it's not just purpose for 15 or 20 years. It's purpose this afternoon, that purpose tomorrow, that Jesus is saying, follow me. In these prerequisite steps to, to, to have that confidence of where we're following Jesus and how we're following Jesus, from denying ourselves, taking our cross to boom, there it is. It's revealed. I, uh, I got a call from the White House one night and, uh, from President Trump. <coughs> and I think it was before the National Day of Prayer. I had the chance to be the co-chairman uh, co of the Prayer Caucus for about five years. And uh, uh, President Trump considered me one of the religious people <laughs> in, the, in the House, which was fine. Uh, and so he invited about five or six of us, two or three House members, two or three senators, had some other evangelical types uh, in the room. And President Trump is talking about all these world religions. It's a uh, there at the dinner table, uh, just uh, outside the Oval Office, and, and he's talking about uh, a conversation that he had had with the Pope about the rise of fundamentalist Islamist militants groups that was really changing the continent in the different countries in Europe, France and other places. You ever been in that situation where the Holy Spirit begins to work on your heart, like, okay, this is where you're supposed to say something? I'm going, oh man, you know, what, what, how, how do, how do, I'm going to interrupt President Trump here, and and, uh, and I began to think about it, but I said, no, I'm, I'm going to talk as I would with anybody else, or hope, hope so. And, and I finally said, well, Mr. President, you see, that's the difference between all other world religions and Christianity. He said, what's that? Mock, in his New York accent, I didn't correct him, but uh, nevertheless, I, I, I began to explain, and I said, well, all these other world religions require you to do something for salvation. But in Christianity, it's what we call the atonement. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, Mr. President, that paid the price for your sins and for my sins. And I just kind of dropped the gospel on him for about two or three minutes there. And I remember walking out of the White House about an hour and a half, two hours later, and, and thinking, man, I, I'm just a small town independent Baptist preacher's kid who got to share the gospel with the President of the United States. And as I was kind of moved by that, also had a second thought in the context of following Jesus. And I asked myself, or probably the Holy Spirit convicted me of this, and I came with this question. I said, would I be just as passionate about sharing my faith in the gospel with the grocery store clerk or the gas station attendant? Would I be that eager, that excited to be able to have that opportunity? You see, when we're following Jesus, God intersects our path with the moments, not just to share the gospel, but to live this out in a way that the world can see the difference in our lives. Think about that for a moment. How does that look like in your life as we look at this passage? And, and we won't unpack verse 25, but it says, for, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, that's counter culture, isn't it? It's always about pursuing our dreams and our goals, and that's good. You, ought, you want to have healthy goals and and excitement about what God's calling you to do. But the context of service, Jesus said he came to serve, to be able to say, Lord, it's broken at times, but here's this life. Take it and use it however you see fit. Is our faith at that level this morning? I want to close with a story about the person that I believe has lived this out more than anybody else that I have witnessed in my life, and that's my father. In fact, this morning, he is, uh, well, he's almost up getting ready, in his words, would shuck the corn in a small independent Baptist country church up in Stokesdale, North Carolina. 77 years old in about a week, serving the Lord faithfully. <clears throat> but I remember growing up, my father did not come from much, came from the backwoods of Alabama, poverty, uh, just racism, everything that you can think of. It was instilled in him at a very early age. And he's, he was called into ministry and began to serve and started a church there, there in the Panhandle of Florida, and a few years later started a Christian school. It was, it was tough at times and, uh, growing up in, in that arena. But I remember a specific day uh, that, uh, that I've reflected on several times that really shows the example of what I'm talking about. My, my younger brothers, I have two younger brothers, uh, and I, I guess at the time I was 14, my middle brother Clay was 12, youngest brother was close to 10. But for whatever reasons, as boys sometimes in the country do, we, we started getting the idea uh, that after mom, the drill sergeant, made us finish our homework, we would go in the backyards, we would get out our BB guns, we'd put our camouflage on, 
And unbeknownst to mom, we came up with the idea, well, let's just have a little war game in the backyard. And to this, to this day, I will tell you, there was something satisfactory shooting the back of my little brother in the leg and hearing him squeal a little bit, right? Um, that, uh, to this, maybe I need to get that right this morning. But anyway, um, but, uh, but we would do that. We would, you know, try to be smart about it. You know, those old Daisy BB guns, you could almost see the trajectory coming out, and we would shoot low, and we had our kind of heavy clothing on at the time when we'd do this. And every now and then, Mom would get a little wise to it, and she said, she would say, boys, you better not be doing that because you might put, all right, you grew up in the South like I did, all right? So, <clears throat> so one afternoon, my middle brother had just kind of pinged me right above uh, above the knee. It wasn't enough to even break the skin. And, and, I, and I had my little Daisy One pump rifle there, and I fired back there. About the time that he drove a dove behind a big pile of pine needles, and it seemed like as soon as I had pulled that little trigger there, he pops up, and he's screaming, running to me, and he's got his hand over his eye. And I run to him, and I, and I jerk it down, and I look into his eye, and it's so full of crimson, it's almost black, just almost full of blood. We get him to our local hospital there in Milton, Florida. They said, there's nothing we can do. They get him quickly over to the University of West Florida Hospital there, about 20 minutes away in Pensacola, Florida. Finally tracked down my dad, who was doing a funeral or something that day, was out uh, working and ministering to people. And got everybody in there, and the doctor said to my mom and dad, he says, I don't have good news. He said, you see, not only one eye <clears throat> apparently is damaged, but the optic nerve, some of you that may study this stuff, has been damaged, and the one optic nerve controls sight to both eyes, and he could lose sight not just in one, but in both eyes. Now, 14 at the time, I turned 53 about a week and a half ago. It's nearly 40 years. It's the most sobering moment that I ever heard because I begin to think, would I lead the rest of my life knowing that I had blinded my younger brother, and we all played sports and all-stars and all the different things that we were involved with. And I didn't know how to process that. We made the decision that we would spend the night there at the hospital, but we needed some things back home about 20 minutes away. I didn't want to stay with my brother because I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to ride back with my dad because I knew and I felt worthy of the wrath that was coming of me. So I decided to ride with my dad. I didn't sit in the front seat next to him, but I slid in the back in that little Toyota five-speed and and off we went. He didn't say anything for about 10 minutes. <clears throat> On the other side of the Interstate 10 Bridge is an old rest area that I don't even know if it's there anymore. But he pulled in that rest area and he began to pray. And I'm not forgetting those words. And he said this. He said, Father God, we have confidence in you. We have followed your will. We have followed you faithfully. We have served you faithfully. And I'm praying right now, Lord, that you would touch Clay's eyes because I believe that you can heal him and then he began to pivot. And then he began to pray this. But if not, I remember seeing a tear come out of his eye. He said, Lord, if more people are to know about Jesus, if this is our cross to carry, Lord, if the world can see Jesus in our life because we have a disabled child, that we will take care of the rest of our natural life, Lord, and just begin to lay that at the Lord's feet. He said, Lord, I want you to know I'm surrendered to your will, whatever that might be. He put that five-speed in reverse, spent the night at the hospital. The next morning, the doctor comes in. He takes the bandage off Clay's eye, looks at my father, looks back at Clay's eyes, and then back to my parents. And he said this, he said, sir, you must be those praying kind of people. My dad said, as a matter of fact, we are. And the doctor said, well, I don't know that I can explain it. He said, last night, your son's eye looked like a shattered window pane. It's all fused back together, and he should have 20-20 vision in both eyes. Now, I say that to say this. I mean, I was certainly wonderfully relieved that I would not carry that burden. But the essence of that about my father, look, I, I, I'm just going to tell you, I don't know that my faith is there. Because one of my children, I don't know if I could just lay it on the altar and surrender. But that's the kind of walk that I'm talking about this morning, that we're able to say, Lord, you made this broken vessel, you put it back together, and today I'm willing to deny myself, take up the cross, and then follow you. See, that, that third part is there's a little bit of rub there. Even the rich young ruler is trying to tell Jesus, I, I, I can do all that. Jesus said, go this direction, I want you to do this. 
because we look at the path. And at first glance, it may look laborious. It may look outside our skill set. It may look like that, wait a second, Lord, I, I just, I'm not equipped to do that. But that's where he wants us to be this morning. Being willing to deny ourselves, take up a cross, and follow him wherever he is calling us to go. Today, tomorrow, wherever it might be. Now this morning, as a wrap up, this has been a message to believers. Maybe you slipped in and said, whew, that was kind of heavy for a non-believer or non-church person, whatever you might be there. Uh, but let me say this to you just real quick. <clears throat> if you would go down and ask any person on any row that's a believer, they would tell you this, unbeliever, they wouldn't trade one second of this journey. Even sometimes there's some valleys that we walk through that are equipping us to accomplish God's will. And I want you to know this gospel that we're preaching on this morning is for you as well. Think about it as we close. Matthew 16, verse 24. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. Father God, as we wrap up this morning, Lord, this is a reminder certainly to me and to all of us as we walk through different moments and different times in our life. Uh, Lord, we can, we can make the journey even more difficult than it is sometimes by just hanging on so stubbornly and hanging on, Lord, in a, in a way that's really almost rebellious when we know that when we trust you with our lives, it always comes out better. But there seems to be a gulf sometimes between where we are versus the trust bridge, if you will, that, that gets us to where we need to be. Lord, have that surrender, that mindset to be fresh and anew this morning. We thank you that we can have great confidence in you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, Pastor Clown. I want you to stand, if you will, with your heads bowed and eyes closed. I believe there's somebody here this morning that there's a burden, there's a situation in your heart that you need to surrender. You need to let go. You may need to come to this altar and just lay it at the feet of Jesus. You've been holding on to my way in this. This is what I want to happen. You won't hear a clearer presentation of that truth that Jesus calls to all of us to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow him. And what that looks like may be you surrendering your all in that situation. Maybe it's a health situation, a family situation, a financial situation. Maybe it's a trial you're going through. The challenge is just to let go of it. I want to give you the opportunity to this morning. The altar's open for prayers. Darren plays the song. What do you need to let go of? What do you need to lay at the feet of Jesus? You know, we've sung for years that song, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. It's one thing to sing it, it's another thing to live it. When the things in our lives that are beyond our control, the things in our lives that we have no hold over, give them to Jesus. Lord, they're yours. I surrender them. I'm going to take up the cross and I'm going to follow him. What is it that's holding you back from being able to follow Jesus like you should? What do you need to let go of? I
continue with the music, but it's these are praying God may be speaking to your heart. Don't miss this opportunity. There's something, you know, there's nothing magical about the altar, but there's something supernatural about a child of God kneeling in the presence of God, talking to our Heavenly Father, pouring out our needs. Aren't you glad that we have Jesus? Aren't you glad that we have Him to take on His yoke that is easy and His burden is light? That command that we've heard this morning, been reminded of this morning, there is nothing more countercultural in our day than that command. To deny ourselves, to take up the cross, and to follow Jesus. And we do it every day, again and again and again. And that is the simplicity of following Christ. If you're thankful for the word we've heard this morning, can I hear you say amen? Amen. Thank you, Mark, for the message that you've brought to us. And love how the word of God just speaks to us so clearly, uh, so simply. And um, it's a privilege to have each one of you here with us this morning. We're glad that you're here. And um, thank God for the privilege to be with the body of Christ. And um, thank God even for hums and buzzes. That I grew up in little country churches, and when you heard something hum or buzz, it wasn't the sound system. <laughs> it was liable of one of those flies or gnats. Or I could tell you some stories about that, but we'll leave that for another time. Make sure our ushers are standing at the back on your way out. You can, they'll receive our morning's offering, or we can put them in the boxes as well. Thank you for your faithful giving. Uh, continue to pray for the gospel that's being shared Pray for souls to be saved. Uh, I encourage you to do that last week. Already heard this that through this week, several folks trusted Christ as people were sharing the gospel with them. So praise the Lord for that. And um, please let Brother Mark know how much you appreciate the word and him being with us today. God bless you. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you back here tonight.